Tens of thousands of people around the world die each year of opioid addiction. One small town has become the heroin overdose capital of the United States, where some of the addicts are babies. I'm Elaine Reyes in Washington, D.C., and this is America's Now. First up, heroin addiction has reached epidemic proportions in suburbs across the U.S., and overdoses are overwhelming authorities. It's very disheartening when we see the repeat overdoses. Uh, you know, we had one the other night. It was, I think he said it was his third time. Correspondent Sean Calos reports from Huntington, West Virginia. He'll show us the harrowing human toll heroin is taking on the town. Next, a doctor providing health services to those who lack access to them. Her association travels to rural communities in El Salvador to administer care and educate. Meet this week's game changer, Vicky Guzman. And later, college debt has surged to alarming levels in the United States. Correspondent Mike Kirsch reports from California on the growing debacle of student debt. Welcome to the show. More Americans have died from drug overdoses and from car accidents, according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And these days, a drug of choice is heroin, touching every age and socioeconomic class. Perhaps you've seen the recent photos of adults OD'd in cars or helpless children in the back. Heroin use in the U.S. has doubled in the past decade, especially among young adults between the ages of 18 to 25. The small town of Huntington, West Virginia, has the distinction of being the overdose capital of America. It also happens to be the hometown of CCTV correspondent Sean Calebs. So he spent the last eight months examining Huntington's heroin epidemic and why it has such a hold on its people. This is what he discovered. What are you doing? You're looking at the face of heroin in the United States. This is 24-year-old Danielle Ott. Her mother took this home video. It was intended to be a wake-up call for her daughter. And this is the result of drugs. Danielle is incoherent, a graphic testament to a life spiraling out of control. And to make matters worse, Danielle, already a mother of two, is pregnant again. She's all I, that's my life right here. She's my life. Danielle has the unwavering support and love of her mother, Melody Anger, a public school bus driver. Danielle is trying to get clean and live her life heroin free. Every time I would try to quit, I would get sick and then I would want it. And it was just, it was the hardest thing I've ever had to do, probably. I've tried to quit it. I tried to quit it, I couldn't tell you how many times. But with the fall also comes a shot at redemption. After trying and failing, trying and failing, Danielle is now on a mission. Danielle quit doing heroin and entered a prenatal program. She's taking a drug called Suboxone to help with the effects of heroin withdrawal. Doctors say her ultrasound looks normal. But there's some damage Danielle cannot undo. Her child will be born addicted to opioids and the many problems that come with it. I just can't handle that, like, looking at my baby and knowing, like, I did that. Like, I just think that is the most selfish thing in the world to do. Danielle grew up a good student with lots of friends, not the kind of person one might think who would get hooked on heroin. I was really against drugs altogether. Like, I did not like drugs at all. Like, I would not talk to somebody if they did a little tiny pain pill. Like, I would freak out. But before Danielle was out of her teens, life changed dramatically. Actually, I found out I was pregnant the day after I graduated high school with my daughter.
So how did this working class young woman go from a loving mother and serious student to a full-blown heroin addict? Her path to addiction is a familiar story in the United States. After the birth of her son two years ago, Danielle developed an ulcer. Doctors gave her powerful opioid pain medication. How long did it take you to get hooked on those pain pills? Not long. Not long at all. I wasn't hurting anymore, but I had it in my head that I was, like, my stomach still hurt and stuff. And so I thought I needed the medicine, but I really, I really was, I didn't need it. I wanted it. And then, then next thing I know, like, I, caught, I like, found myself, like, needing them every day, all day long. It's not uncommon to see first responders in Huntington assist overdose victims from the brush near the Ohio River. It's one place for users to get high. Doctors writing millions of prescriptions for opioids help fuel a U.S. crisis, a generation of junkies involving hundreds of thousands of people. By now, Danielle was always chasing the high, but her prescription for oxycodone had run out. And on the street, a single pill can sell for $80. I called my friend looking for pills, and she told me that she couldn't get them, that she had heroin on her right then and there, that it was the same thing as pain pills. After that, you know, I didn't, what was the point in buying pills whenever I can spend 30 bucks on that? Danielle tells her story in an American town I know well. Huntington, West Virginia. Population, 50,000. Huntington has the unwelcome distinction of being the heroin overdose capital of the United States. It's also my hometown. I grew up here, played baseball as a kid, graduated from what was then Huntington East High School, went to college at Marshall University. I've known the city's mayor, Steve Williams, a long time. Huntington was built with steel and railroad jobs. But these days, rail cars, once loaded with coal, sit mostly idle. Heavy industry has taken a hit during the economic downturn. But Huntington rebounded as Marshall University expanded and the region's largest hospital, Cabell Huntington, blossomed into a teaching facility. People are starting to invest in our community, but what's breaking my heart is there is this flip side. This truly is, Sean, this is what I will say the tale of two cities. It's the best of times, but we have truly the worst of times. If anybody had told me two years ago that I would be as immersed in this issue, I would have never and would have never ever believed it. The tree-lined streets are clean. This working class town is dotted with quaint homes and a popular park system. So my hometown isn't suffering with the graffiti and blight that plagues other U.S. cities wrestling with the heroin crisis. But on one mid-August day, the opioid problem pushed the city, its first responders, police, and hospitals to its very limit. Remember, this is only a town of 50,000, and in one four-hour period, 26 people overdosed on heroin. One of the most common things that you'll see happen is the uh, people start dumping, uh, literally dumping people um, out at the hospital. I think that the most interesting thing about the uh, how that began was the uh, the first call came out. Dispatch advised that the uh, the caller said, "Send the police, send help." Uh, that everyone that came into the house was dying. On the front lines, five nights a week, Sergeant Phil Watkins says drugs and related crime and death are commonplace. Calls come in all the time. In this case, a man in his early 30s has OD'd and is no longer breathing. First responders are working frantically to reverse the effects of a heroin overdose. All emergency personnel in this town carry a drug called naloxone, marketed as Narcan. All it takes is one injection to override the fact heroin has shut down his breathing and slowed his heartbeat. I'll tell you what, we need to take you to the hospital. He's giving you Narcan. And slowly, he comes out of the opioid stupor and cheats death. We want you to get medical help, okay? okay we just don't want you to die. It's very disheartening when we see the repeat overdoses. Uh, you know, we had one the other night. It was, I think he said it was his third time. Um, and, you know, I just told him, um, 
you know you're, you're playing the odds at this point. There's not a family, there's not a neighborhood, there's not a block, there's not a business, there's not a church that isn't Im impacted by this. Yeah. Holly and Patrick Hickman are the last people, you would think, who would have their lives touched by the heroin epidemic in the U.S. Affluent, active in the community. He's a bank vice president, she's a teacher. We've had a great marriage from day one. Um, we uh, are a fortunate couple in that we share a whole lot of common interests. They really are that married couple who are the best of friends. Both are Huntington natives from upstanding families. Patrick's late father, Bob Hickman, a pharmacist, gave me my first job while in college working at Cabell Huntington Hospital. Their world was perfect with the addition of two healthy boys. Uh, Turner is first, blonde hair, blue eyes, questions galore, just cute as a button. And then Zachary came along and he's looked more like Patrick. Separated by just a couple of years, Turner made sure his younger brother Zachary always got to hang out with the big kids. Carefree, Turner cultivated his own look and lifestyle. Whitewater rafting, uh, you know, uh, hiking, you know, all the extreme type sports, things that challenge you physically. A close family, the Hickmans chronicled their children's growth each year during an annual beach vacation. What the couple didn't know until Turner's senior year at Marshall University was the dangerous path the 23-year-old was on. He left his backpack in somebody's car and <laughs> the mother found it and looked and found paperwork in, the back, in there from the hospital. And he had gone in and had OD'd. The Hickmans were floored. Turner had overdosed on heroin. We, we were ignorant. We were ignorant of heroin the Heroin was something, you know, people in alleys did that yeah. I'd never, and when I heard that the first time, I was just absolutely shocked. I was like, that is like big time. So I don't know who, inter who introduced heroin to him. I don't know when, where, or what it was, um, but... Um, it's not hard to find at Huntington, which is... No. It's like super easy. The overdose capital of the United States was threatening to rip apart the family. He said it was a one-time thing, it was an experiment, it was a mistake, and I'm, I'm over it. Well, as loving parents who are used to a child that doesn't lie to you and does the right thing, I, I was good with it. Right. And I was then, literally good with it and moved then. on. That is, until a late night call delivered another shock. It was a girl and she said, I know you think that Turner hasn't done drugs, but he is yeah. using. In hindsight, they can see the change. You know, you hate I look back at pictures, and he is yellowish looking. He looked terrible. The family united, circled the wagons, and got Turner into therapy and rehab. They were optimistic, but Holly's father is a physician and offered a sobering prognosis addicts slip. You know, I'm thinking he said he had, he's made it 90 days. You know, we're going to be the one. I remember screaming at my father, who was the, the not the naysayer, the knowledgeable one. And he was saying, honey, 99% of the people go back and, and use again. Well, and I was, why can't he be the 1%? The goal was to get Turner clean for 90 days. Things were going well. Then, just a few days shy of the goal, Holly got a phone call. I said, oh, hi, Turner, and um, somebody was on the phone, and they said, we're trying to reach Turner's dad, and I said, well, this is his mother, and they said, well, we're at Turner's apartment, and he's gone, and I said, gone where? What are you talking about? And they said, he's dead, and he overdosed, and I just dropped I, in everything. Patrick and Holly rushed to his apartment. There were police, an ambulance, flashing lights, and confusion. Police stopped Holly from going inside the apartment to see Turner's body. I'm his mom, I'm his mom, I want to go in. They said, you don't want to see him like that. When they relapse, they go back and they get a dose that they took before they went off. That dose is too powerful in many, many cases. It was six agonizing days before they saw Turner at the funeral home. And people say closure. It's not closure. There's no closure. Well, but I mean, it, was it, it was helpful. It was helpful, but it was not, yeah. no magical thing happens. 
Getting Turner heroin free for three months had been an important milestone. They were going to celebrate as a family and go skydiving together. Holly and her blonde haired, blue eyed, question filled child took one last trip together as she scattered his ashes. Huntington is in danger of losing a generation. You're looking at the youngest addicts. At Cabell Huntington Hospital, the staff says one out of every four babies born here comes into the world addicted to heroin. Danielle's newborn will be a member of this group with shaking and tremors and trouble digesting food. I want to cry. I was talking to a girl the other day and she had just had her baby. And she was telling me like, I can't do this right now. <laughs> And she was telling me about, like, after she had her baby, how her baby started going through withdrawals. Almost three days later, she told me about it tremoring. Some of the nurses at Lily's Place work here. Sarah Murray is a neonatal therapeutic nurse who will work closely with Danielle and her baby once the child is born. And we have a 36 bed unit in the NICU. And at that point, we were um, turning away transports of critically ill infants that needed to be here. There are so many heroin addicted babies born here, other newborns with life threatening ailments have to be turned away and transported to facilities not nearly as qualified to handle babies in crisis. Most of our babies, probably, I'm going to give a guesstimate of about 80% of our babies are polysubstance abuse. Meaning more than one? More than one drug. Were you doing other drugs as well? Uh, no. I wasn't drinking or anything like that. Um, the only other thing I was doing was like meth. And that was it. And just meth and heroin. That's all I was doing. Dr. Sean Loudon has devoted his career and his life to working with babies born to moms who do drugs. Loudon will oversee the care Danielle's baby receives. A native West Virginian, Loudon has won absolute mandate for his staff. Anybody who works um, here in this facility will have a non-judgmental attitude and their approach um, to the parents and to the babies. People can't even fathom some of the stories that these moms tell of their own abuse, of their own, you know, horrific childhood. Many of them come from families who, where their mothers and their grandmothers have been addicted and it's just, they're normal. As strange as it is to us and as abnormal as it is to us to crush up a pill and snort it, it's normal to them. Danielle got drawn into that hideous cycle. You just don't care about nothing anymore. And like, all you worry about is like, well, I want to do more, I want to do more, I want to do more, I want to do more. Murray says working with drug addicted newborns is challenging, but progress is coming. We learned that everything we thought we were doing to help the babies was really making their withdrawal. We were overstimulating and making their withdrawal more difficult for them. Out of necessity, the hospital staff created a neonatal therapeutic unit, different and separate from the intensive care nursery. It's quiet, less light, less stimulation, which is good for addicted infants. Loudon says before criticizing mothers like Danielle, remember in 2012, doctors wrote 260 million opioid prescriptions, enough to supply every adult in the country with his or her own bottle of pain tablets. When birth occurs, that baby's supply to the drug is instantaneously cut off. And so the baby is quitting whatever substance that mom has been taking, cold turkey. If you ask any addict what it feels like to withdraw, the first thing they will tell you is it's very painful. And these babies are no different and uh, classically from opiates, a lot of what they will sort of show are neurologic symptoms. Um, they will shake, um, have tremors, um, they'll have increased muscle tone, they'll be irritable, um, cry. 
Loudon tries to step away from the pressure when he can, but he's always thinking of ways to pull his community out of the throes of an addiction crisis. But it's not just Huntington. There's an epidemic across the United States. The most recent statistics show nearly half a million people addicted to opioids in the U.S. We have to break the cycle of hopelessness some way, somehow. I think hope is everything. Um, our country faces this epidemic, um, and there's no denying that. But there are people who are trying to change that. Loudon and his staff learn babies born addicted to opioids don't necessarily have to spend months in a hospital. So they help turn a vacant office building in a residential section of Huntington into Lily's place. It's a facility that is set up um, for its sole purpose being to treat babies who are going through withdrawal. We are basically um, able to provide the same care that these babies get in a hospital setting, but it's just not in a hospital. We're fortunate to have some very forward thinkers um, and people who are willing to, to sort of stick their neck out um, and try something different because what had been, you know, the same thing for years and years and years didn't seem to be working effectively. Unlike crack cocaine babies, newborns suffering from heroin addiction typically don't come into the world with physical birth defects. But Loudon says opiates have a way of rewiring a baby's brain. While there's a lot of money being put into treatment, there are many medical unknowns. We are slowly changing some of that rewiring. But the, the simple fact of the matter is we don't know how much of that we accomplish. And frankly, it differs from every individual. Lily's place costs about $1.2 million a year to run. Roughly 25% of that comes from private donations. Almost everything here was donated. The wipes, the diapers, other supplies. The rest of the funding comes from insurance, state, and federal sources. And for people such as Danielle, people shunned by society, they found something else. People who didn't judge. What we didn't realize is that we would really start caring about the moms. They're your daughter, they're your niece, they're your neighbor's daughter. We didn't plan on falling in love with them and wanting to make their lives better. They are all addicted, and most, like Danielle Utt, are scared, wondering if they will ever have a normal life again. Danielle's baby could end up in a room at Lily's place where everything was donated by Turner Hickman's family. She has the chance Turner never got. Nationally, the Obama administration is proposing $1.1 billion to fight the opioid crisis. Not nearly enough, according to those fighting the epidemic on the front lines. I wish we could have all $1.1 billion of that right here because I think it's going to take a huge amount of resources to be able to attack this on the scale that it needs to be in certain communities because of just how, how massive of a problem it is in these communities. The staff wants to help these young moms and wants to believe they want to get straight. But history has shown addicts will do just about anything to get a fix, even if it jeopardizes the well-being of their newborn. Um, and that does happen on a weekly basis um, for us. Not everything has a happy ending. Um, as much as we strive for those happy endings, the reality of drug abuse is, is sobering. This is an obvious statement. <laughs> Nothing's more permanent than death. One thing I've come to understand in my life, and we've seen this in so many other people's lives, but I've come to understand that life is a series of second and third chances. Holly and Patrick will never forget Turner. Part of his enduring legacy is a tree planted in Huntington's Ritter Park to keep his memory alive so others won't make the same tragic missteps he made. This is the face of hope in the ongoing fight against heroin abuse. Danielle gave birth to a five pound, seven ounce girl named Skylar. It's changed my life. 
I mean, that's really all I can say. I mean, my life is completely different than what it used to be. Yep, she's two weeks old today. But Skylar came into the world addicted to opioids, and weaning the newborn will take time, and it will be a painful process. She's been good. I mean, I, mean, I don't like that she's going through withdrawals and stuff. I mean, it sucks to watch. I mean, it's the hardest thing I've ever had to do, honestly. The, the baby is progressing um, through the weaning process uh, relatively well. Still has some good moments and still has some bad moments um, with her withdrawal symptoms. Um, but so far, um, everything has gone you know, relatively well in her weaning process. Frankly, her quality of life is, has uh, the potential just like every other child in this whole entire world does. Um, but a lot depends on her family. Meaning Danielle and the baby's father have to find ways to avoid falling into the same trap. Are you worried about slipping? I'm not at the moment, no. Because watching her go through this and the stuff that she's had to go through, just, it makes me never want to look at it or see it again. It's too early to know if this chapter will have a happy ending. But Danielle has the desire, and for the time being, the support needed to stay clean. And even if Danielle and her family find happiness, Huntington will be dealing with a crisis and a generation of junkies for years to come. The U.S. averages 15 overdose deaths out of every 100,000 people. In West Virginia, that rate is more than double. The CDC says people using opioid painkillers are 40 times more likely to get hooked on heroin. Coming up. We'll speak to a drug policy researcher from the Institute of Public Health. This is not uh, unique to the United States, uh, but I think that our policy responses have been particularly bad that, that have inflamed uh, this problem. America's Net. Welcome back. While heroin seems to be making the most headlines recently, are there other drugs close to sparking a similar epidemic? what other trends are making their way around the world. For more on that, let's bring in San Ho Tree, director of the Drug Policy Project at the Institute for Policy Studies. Thank you so much for joining us here on America's Now. Well, let's begin with heroin. Uh, communities throughout the U.S. are seeing this surge in heroin overdoses. People are dying. We've seen the photos of, of adults with their children in the back seat. They're overdosed in, in the front seat. How is heroin getting into these communities? Where is it all beginning? Well, a lot of it is coming through over the borders, uh, but also by sea, by air, by uh, tunnels. So um, it's coming from lots of different places. Uh, Mexico supplies a lot of the heroin consumed, particularly in the east of the U.S. Uh, and, and Colombia also is a major producer of heroin. But of course, Afghanistan is also a globally a big, uh, the biggest producer. But uh, not much of the Afghan heroin reaches most of the United States. It's mostly coming through the southern uh, regions um, to the U.S. Why are we seeing this resurgence in heroin? You were speaking earlier, and, and when I think of heroin, I think back to the 80s and 90s when you heard about it uh, a lot, and now here we are again, reaching young people. Is it popular? Is it because it's cheap? Why are we seeing all of A this? lot of this is very cyclical. So you see these trends in different drug use. Uh, you know, different generations will, will abuse a certain drug. The younger cohorts, your siblings, will see that it's a terrible drug to use. They'll stay away from it for a generation, then it comes back. But a lot of this also comes from uh, a confluence of factors. Number one, we've had an opioid prescription problem in the United States, um, driven by a lot of, of private corporations, uh, the drug manufacturers themselves, uh, who aggressively marketed um, you know, OxyContin and other drugs for, uh, you know, uh, for, for long-term pain as well as short-term pain. Um, which is very, very problem problematic. Um, but apart from the marketing practice, we also have something, you know, uh, what I call pill culture. So since 1997, we, our airwaves now are flooded with prescription drug ads. You can't turn on the cable news at any point without seeing just, just ad after ad every hour. You're, you're bombarded with ads. There's a pill for every problem. Uh, and people no longer think that, uh, you know, they get, they get accustomed to thinking that if it came from a factory that's been prescribed by a doctor, in a prescription pad, that's been inspected, it comes in a blister 
your pack, it must be somehow safe to use or the government wouldn't have approved it. Um, and that's a terrible culture to create. But let's be honest here, there are a lot of people who really do need these prescription painkillers and aren't abusing. In fact, uh, most of the people who, begin, uh, who, who become addicted to prescription drugs um, are abusing and they're stealing. They're, it's called smurfing, right? You go to a neighbor's house or a friend's or, or you steal from relatives to their medicine cabinet, that sort of thing, or the black market. Um, and most of these people are not being prescribed uh, these opiates by their doctors. So they may, their introduction to the heroin may have been uh, abusing prescription drugs um, shared by, amongst friends. And um, as that got more popular, our, our DEA and other agencies had a very predictable uh, response, which is to crack down and overprescribing. That not only hurt a lot of people who are in legitimate need of these painkillers, but also it, it helped push a lot of these people who were problematic users, having some dependency on these things, to find cheaper sources of opiates. And that, of course, was street heroin. Um, you don't need a prescription. It's much, much, much cheaper. Uh, and it, it's, 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 it's everywhere. Um, and word of mouth, you can find it. You don't have to figure out how do you get a fake doctor's prescription or, or where you're going to steal it from or anything like that. And so that was a very predictable uh, trajectory, unfortunately. Um, and the DEA's new policy, I mean, their, their current policy is to crack down on heroin, of course. Um, it's a one-size-fits-all solution, but the more we crack down on heroin, when you already have so many people who are, who are dependent on, the, on these opiates, uh, what are they going to do? What are the dealers going to do? If the supply of drugs uh, begins to constrict through the drug war, but you still have a huge pop population that's dependent on these drugs, uh, the dealers are going to find new substitutes or new ways to stretch their drugs uh, to, to, to maintain their profits or increase their profits. And that comes, you know, here comes fentanyl which is a really disastrous uh, uh, thing to happen to this industry, um, where it's much, much, much stronger than heroin. They mix it with the, the heroin, the dealers, in order to increase their, their, their profits, to stretch their, their drug supply. Uh, but the users are very often don't know what it, what's in there. And they think they're getting heroin, but in fact, they're getting something much, much more potent. So is that the new drug to watch, fentanyl? Yes, uh, and there are all kinds of other substitutes. That's the nature of the war on drugs, that prohibition breeds substitutes that are often more dangerous, more problematic, more difficult to stop. Um, and so we keep chasing this problem and creating new unintended consequences. Well, obviously, there is a huge demand for these type of drugs in the United States. Uh, you mentioned Colombia and Mexico as suppliers or where, where these drugs originate. Where else in the world are we seeing uh, this heroin epidemic take hold? Well, in Mexico itself, it's beginning now, in the, in, uh, particularly in Sinaloa and where the stuff is coming from. Uh, but also uh, in Afghanistan, and you know, a huge problem there. Uh, but in many other countries, this is not uh, unique to the United States. Uh, but I think that our policy responses have been particularly bad that, that have inflamed uh, this problem. Um, I think the drug czar's office, to their credit, has done a lot of good work promoting harm reduction, uh, which uh, just you know, one administration ago was a phrase you would not have heard uttered uh, in the halls of government. Which countries around the world are handling the war on drugs the best. Uh, they don't have the same type of problems that the United States has when it comes to the demand for it. Many other countries are doing this better. There's, there is, in fact, the, many of the solutions that uh, we think are so elusive and, and so remote, in fact, already exist. But they exist in, in a sort of a mosaic around the world. Um, so best practices from various countries can be cobbled together to create a much better holistic uh, approach to this problem. For instance, uh, Portugal in 2000 decriminalized possession of all drugs. They've had much better results now as a result of that. It's very counterintuitive. Uh, but uh, better rates in terms of problematic drug use, ability to treat people, to divert resources from wasteful uh, law enforcement and incarceration into prevention, dissuasion. Um, Canada, for instance, uh, is, is in the process of approving legalized prescription heroin for the most, most seriously addicted people. That is to say, if you failed at all other treatment modalities, that methadone hasn't worked for you, that uh, abstinence hasn't worked, um, nothing else has worked, then it, it makes sense for the state to say, okay, you have a problem, you're addicted to heroin, we'd rather you didn't do it, we, we're going to make sure that it's not easy to get, you can't go to a pharmacist and say, I'm bored this week, let me try some of this or that type of heroin. Uh, it's only if you fail at other treatment modalities and you're intent on using heroin, they don't want you to go back to the street to buy uh, street heroin, which nobody knows what's in it. Right? It's very often adulterated fentanyl, or uh, before that, it was, sometimes it was 7% pure heroin, sometimes it was 70% pure heroin. That's a big difference. And nobody uh, uses heroin with a purpose of, of overdosing. Right? It's because they don't know what's in the street heroin. Um, so there are lots of different ways we can approach this problem without resorting to, to prisons and, and policing, uh, an over-reliance on policing. 
San Ho Tree, thank you so much for joining us on America's Now. Thanks for having me. Coming up. A traveling health care clinic treats the poor in El Salvador. Our association mainly provides medical services, but we also help communities with economic development. America's Now. Welcome back to America's Now. Access to medical care in rural El Salvador has always been a challenge. Roads in one of Central America's poorest nations don't reach everyone. Isolation has contributed to increased poverty and mortality rates among people with preventable diseases. But back in 1972, Vicky Guzman set out to change that. Today, her organization, the Salvadorian Association for Rural Health, is making dramatic improvements in the lives of thousands in the countryside. Vicky is this week's Game Changer. Mi nombre completo es Eduvigis Auxiliadora Guzmán de Luna, pero mi, la gente me conoce como Vicky Guzmán. Este, yo soy médica y yo me defino como médica comunitaria. La idea de fundar esta institución hace, hace como 35, en 1972. Aquí en El Salvador me encuentro a comunidades en pobreza y en necesidad a 26 kilómetros de la ciudad. Entonces a mí se me hizo que había una necesidad urgente de atención médica. En ese entonces el sistema de salud en El Salvador no llegaba a las zonas rurales. Actualmente los servicios que da nuestra institución, eh, hemos tratado siempre de, de trabajar con los condicionantes de la salud. Trabajamos con aspectos de desarrollo económico, que tiene mucho que ver con la salud. ¿verdad? Tenemos programas donde le permitimos a la mujer, especialmente a la mujer rural, tener un pequeño eh, capital para que haga un negocio. ¿verdad? Otra de la, otro de los ejes muy importantes ha sido trabajar con los niños y las niñas desde de, de, de que nacen hasta que tienen siete años en un programa que se llama Brotes de Esperanza, eh, enfocándonos en la educación primaria, que es sumamente importante para el desarrollo de estos niños y niñas. Y luego tenemos el programa de Ángeles Descalzos, que este programa está dirigido para adolescentes, ¿verdad? donde va orientado todo nuestro trabajo a, en este momento a prevenir la violencia, a, a desarrollar liderazgo, a, desa a desarrollar potenciales en esta, en esta población. Otro programa muy importante es un programa de salud visual. El programa de salud visual eh, fue una idea muy, muy novedosa en aquel entonces para atender a las poblaciones rurales, pobres. Contamos con una clínica que tiene atención hospitalaria, atención quirúrgica. Eh, esta clínica está equipada eh, con un equipo de punta. Este 
este tipo de trabajo, de, de trabajar con comunidades en necesidad y haciendo cosas no tradicionales, sí es difícil. Y fue difícil desde que lo estaba haciendo una mujer en un país machista, ¿verdad? Aparte de, de toda la violencia política y la de guerra. Tuve la suerte de que gran parte de la gente en ese entonces no conocía a un médico. Entonces este, la gente decía, ¿será o no será? Y me tocaban y me pellizcaban y decían, ¿es cierto que es doctora? Sí, son buzos, porque estamos perdiendo esa, esa, esa capacidad que los chicos ya han desarrollado. ¿Podemos Yo estoy a punto de poner así el campo de tirando de las zonas rurales a buscar trabajo en la ciudad. Entonces ahí se formó una comunidad alrededor de tipo Polo Norte. Mi mamá ha sido una mujer increíble, maravillosa, con mucha visión y eso me lo transmitió desde pequeña, ¿verdad? A soñar en grande, a creer que las cosas podían ser mejor y es eso a lo, que, a lo que me dedico ahora prácticamente, a invitar a otros a que sigan creyendo que el cambio es posible. The organization's focus goes beyond rural health. Its integral and holistic approach is opening new roads to development for hundreds of thousands of people. We'd love to have your input, so if you know someone who's helping change the world, drop us a line at an at cctv-america.com or tweet us at cctv underscore America and tell us about a game changer you would like to see on America's Now. Coming up. U.S. students buried under crushing college debt. I'm hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt now. Um, probably coming up close to 400,000. Um, it's scary. America's Next. Welcome back. A staggering 40 million college students are in debt or have defaulted on their college loans in the United States. How much debt? Almost one and a half trillion dollars worth. And yet, unlike failing Wall Street banks who declared bankruptcy during the 2008 recession, college students today are not offered the same kind of relief. Among them, thousands of students from Latin American countries who say the American dream has plunged them into life-crushing debt. America's Now correspondent Mike Kirsch reports. In the United States, college graduates don't call it the game of loans for nothing when it comes to taking out loans for a college education. Today, more than 40 million college students and graduates are in debt or have defaulted on their loans. Many of them unable to pay back their loans because they claim they can't find employment after graduating or that their salaries are too low to make substantial loan payments. Protesting before the U.S. government and all over the internet, what they allege is a network of predatory student loan lenders, such as student loan companies like Sally May, that's loaned more than $180 billion to students, or such as major banks making student loans like Wells Fargo. Many of these publicly traded institutions making billions of dollars in profits each year off student borrowers stuck with skyrocketing interest rates and penalty fees. And even when students default on their loans, lenders get their money back anyway because the U.S. government guarantees these loans 
which means if students don't pay off their loans, U.S. taxpayers are stuck paying them off. And there are abuses in the college loan game. There are some extremes in which student borrowers use their loans, not for school. Las Vegas, Vegas, baby. But for living la vida loca across the American landscape. And when it comes to collecting on loans, there are extremes that authorities have taken to force students to pay back their loans. Well, how about being arrested by the U.S. Marshal's office? Like when a team of heavily armed federal marshals in Houston, Texas, recently showed up at this former college student's home, arresting him because he failed to pay off a $1,500 loan from almost 30 years ago. Some of the worst abusers are said to be U.S. colleges. For example, one of the nation's largest for-profit private colleges, the Art Institute, with campuses across the U.S., has been accused by the U.S. Justice Department of fraudulently recruiting low-income students and raking in $11 billion in government student loan money to cover their tuitions, even when it knew there was a history of lower-income students not finishing school or paying back their loans. The Art Institute eventually settled out of court, paying back the government $95 million. But the damage was done for Art Institute students like Ana Martinez. I was born in Mexico. Ana says her parents brought her to the U.S. from the Mexican state of Sinaloa in hopes of her getting a college education here. Well, if you don't go to college here, you can't become anything here. That's just how this country works. Ana's dream, as glimpsed from the drawings in her art portfolio, is to become an animator in Hollywood. And after high school, Anna says she was persuaded to pursue a degree in animation by a recruiter here at the Art Institute of California in Los Angeles. I came here and figured, you know, with the promise that they gave me, you know, saying the average uh, animator makes 60000 when you get out of school. The school was a little expensive. It was about $97,000. Um, but I figured with 60000 after you graduate, I mean, that's payable in five years, you know? Her loans that were co-signed by her family only covered the cost of her classes. My first year, I already was in debt $40,000. Anna had no extra money for rent or food, so she took a minimum wage job at a hotel near the school. I would work the night shifts from uh, 11 p.m. to 7, and then as soon as I got out, try to make it to class. Anna would eventually quit her job and live in her car when she realized working to pay her rent was interfering with her education. So I ended up moving into my car. <laughs> there was nights that it was dangerous. I'm a girl and who knows what could have happened to me. And it was hard for me because I, I mean, it was in general just, I never would have thought like I would be, you know, I never would have thought in my life, whole life, because I was a good kid in high school, did sports, academics. Um, I never would have thought someone like that could end up sleeping in our car just to graduate out of art school. In the end, Anna never graduated after the Art Institute suspended her for failing to complete her coursework on time. She presently works a minimum wage job selling clothes at a department store while her loan payments with interest and penalty fees have now ballooned to over $150,000. She says loan collectors are constantly hounding her and her family for payment. If I don't make payments soon, that they're going to start garnishing my wages from my pay, which I'm like, I'm barely surviving. After hearing Anna's story, CCTV traveled 100 miles north here to the University of California at Santa Barbara to meet two heavily in debt PhD students, Kathy Swift and Yanira Rivas Pineda. I have close to 100,000 worth of student debt. I'm hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt now, um, probably co coming up close to 400,000. Um, it's scary. Kathy and Yanira say they've witnessed fellow students in debt who've had to rely on local food handouts or asking people for money on street corners. One of my neighbors, I saw him literally standing outside with a sign asking for money. And I was like, you know, this is a UCSB student, a college student. The students are going hungry. Um, they don't have the money to buy food. There's uh, millions of us now that are in this crisis of the student loan situation. If you're asking why so many U.S. students are now in debt, it's partly because college tuitions are much higher these days. 
so loans are larger to cover the costs. And because private student loans and U.S. government loans are both relatively easy to get, says Ike Brannan, a visiting fellow specializing in fiscal policy at the Cato Institute. People who might not have the resources to go to college right now can borrow money against their future income, and they can go to college. And that's a great transaction. The average yearly income for someone with a college degree uh, far exceeds people who don't have a college degree. College still pays off in the long run for people. Student loans are a structurally predatory lending system, crushing tens of millions of people. College has not paid off in the long run for Alan College, an aerospace engineering graduate whose career path, he says, was derailed by job freezes following September 11th attacks on the U.S. back in 2001. Turning him into a one-man protesting machine before the U.S. government over how college loan debt is skyrocketing for him and millions of others like him. Predatory lending right here! There comes a time when everybody has to take a stand uh, on things and um, for me there is no more valuable battle that I could be fighting. Collins has founded a grassroots organization of fellow students who are in debt called studentloanjustice.org demanding debt relief from the U.S. government. So student loans are more predatory and vicious than any other type of loan in this country uh, to where a uh, you know, $10,000 loan uh, can very quickly become a $50,000, $100,000 nightmare, uh, and there is absolutely no recourse for the borrower. Alan says in his case, what began as $38,000 in loans very quickly escalated to over a hundred thousand uh, dollars in debt uh, within about a year, year and a half of them defaulting my loans in December 2001. And it was at that point that I realized something was very wrong with this lending system. We've had uh, family members from three different people uh, come to us and um, describe how their sister, brother, son um, committed suicide as a direct result of pressures associated with their student loan debt. The best possible solution to this problem, says Collins, is for the U.S. government to restore bankruptcy laws that once protected students here, laws that have been altered over the years to better protect lenders rather than students. Collins says historically, the right to file bankruptcy was a paramount right for individuals going back to America's founding fathers. The founding fathers, people, a lot of people don't realize George Washington, uh, Thomas Jefferson, and others were deeply in debt to British banks and merchants when they penned the Declaration of Independence and when they fought the Revolutionary uh, War. Um, it should come as no surprise then, people who uh, read the Constitution, I urge, uh, look at Article 1, Section 8, when the powers of Congress were enumerated in the Constitution, very long list of powers. Near the top of this list, like item number three of 17, is a uniform bankruptcy code. So the fact that bankruptcy protections were so prominent in the U.S. Constitution should be very telling. Agreeing with Alan Collins that bankruptcy rights should be restored for students who can't pay their debts is fiscal policy specialist Ike Brannan. You can't get blood from a stone. The money's just not there. I think it's really disturbing to think that we've taken one thing student loans and we've excluded it from the bankruptcy provision. I, I, to me it doesn't make any sense at all. What is so special about student loans that we're going to treat student debt different than every other type of debt that, that people enter into? Differently, for example, than the favorable treatment Wall Street enjoyed during the massive U.S. economic recession in 2008 when banks and housing lenders were about to go out of business after Americans defaulted on 700 billion dollars in home loans. The U.S. government bailed out these lending institutions at the taxpayer's expense. And if we can bail out the banks, why can't we bail out the students? There are limited federal loan relief programs that allow some students to delay payments or to spread payments out over 25 years. Though many college loan borrowers are said to be essentially stuck with years of debt ahead of them, with no relief in sight. It's about a third of all people who have some graduate with some kind of student debt, and that average student debt is about $30,000. The total amount of student debt is large. It's over a trillion dollars. Um, I think there's some question as to what would happen if 
we saw people start to default in mass. Well, there are 44 million people in the country with student loans. Of these 44 million people, about 27 million are currently unable to repay their loans. They are either in default, they're in deferment, they're in forbearance, or they're otherwise delinquent. This is nearly one in 10 of everybody you see in this country walking down the street. This is about 10% of the population of this country. It's a huge problem. The amount of economic activity that does not, that does not happen as a result of this massive uh, debt cudgel hanging over the nation is significant. As significant as the toll college loan debt is taking on individual borrowers. Yeah, it's changed my life. Um, I'll never have a normal American life, whatever that is. So I think the only way to deal with it, and that is just go out loud and proud. That is destroying the lives of tens of millions of our citizenry. Going out loud, says Alan Collins, is how he plans to proceed from here, demanding the right of bankruptcy be returned to college loan borrowers. Our mission is to compel Congress to return the standard consumer protections that were uh, wrongly removed from student loans. I mean, what kind of a country feeds upon its young, uh, such as w what we're seeing uh, the, lending, the student lending system do to people who committed no crime, uh, their only crime was pursuing higher education. Some financial analysts fear a massive student loan default might be coming. They'll say it's difficult to gauge just how grave a crisis there is right now. For people who have $100,000 worth of student loans, it's definitely a crisis for them. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again next week for another edition of America's Now.